All right, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. We had a week of low activity here at the church because we encourage people to be with their loved ones celebrating. And Thursday, of course, was Thanksgiving, my favorite holiday, and not because of the turkey, but because a Christian's attitude needs to be an attitude of gratitude. We have so much to be thankful for, and it's always the case. God is always on his throne, and God is always in control, and he loves us and blesses us, and there's not a reason whatsoever, no matter what's going on in this world, the storms, the, the economic problems, all the strife that's going on out there, we have no reason whatsoever to despair. Our God is the King of heaven, and his son Jesus has come to this world, and he's made it so that we can have our sins forgiven. We're going to talk about forgiveness today. It's a great and wonderful topic that every Christian needs to hear and every non-Christian needs to hear. So I hope you will find it very, very relevant. We're in the book of Mark and we've finished chapter 1. In chapter 1, we saw the main theme of the book, that Jesus is the Son of God. And by Son of God, it is meant that He is is God, right? You, you Humans reproduce and their children are human. And God is the Father of Jesus, the Son. So He is God, the Son, which means He came with divine authority. Jesus has divine authority because He's God. And yet, He laid aside that authority and He accepted His role and responsibility as our Messiah. He was baptized Right? And he received the Holy Spirit as the anointing for his messianic ministry. And then he went out into the wilderness and he overcame the devil's temptations. And then he showed up preaching the gospel of the soon coming kingdom. We saw in verse 22 that he had authority to preach the good news. The joyful tidings that God is on the throne and His kingdom is coming to earth. He spoke with authority, not as the usual teachers of the day, but He spoke from Himself. He had authority to preach the good news. He had authority, in verse 27, to defeat Satan and to heal diseases. Jesus did that to show that He was who He said He was and who He was sent to be. And we saw in verse 41 that he had authority to cancel the old traditions. So the Jews were very aware of what the Old Testament preached, and they set up a whole system of religious adherences to be able to try and not violate anything in the Old Testament. But all of those traditions of man, Jesus comes and he says, you know what? That's not my new teaching. And he even healed a leper. And before he healed him, he reached out and embraced him. He touched a leper. That is a no-no in terms of the Old Testament rules. And yet he did. And then the leper, he warned him angrily, don't tell anyone what I did. And the reason why was because people were coming to him in droves and he was not able to preach. He got... He was busy all day long from sun up to sundown healing. And he wanted to be able to get that message out because it's the message that's powerful to save. Healing is a picture of salvation, right? If you're dead in your sins, you're sick in your sins, or like the man in today's text, you're paralyzed and your legs are dead, yet the Word of God is what strengthens and heals and gives life. Healing that Jesus does by a miracle, he does because he cares about people. Even the leper who he knew was going to go out and, and proclaim what happened to him, he was angry about that, but yet he healed him because he was a man who was suffering. And Jesus is tenderhearted and kind, gracious, compassionate, loving, and he wants to bless your life Whatever's wrong in your life, whatever suffering you're going through, he wants to bless it. 
His ways are mysterious. He doesn't always heal instantly like he did in those examples we saw in chapter 1. But he does want to heal it. And if you will accept him as your Savior, if you become a Christian and follow the Lord Jesus, you're guaranteed an eternity in, in the future of where you'll never be sick, never get old. He'll wipe away every tear. Jesus has promised that. That's his good news. Now we're in chapter 2, and we're going to see that he has power to forgive sins. And that's something we all need. What is a sin, by the way? A sin... Now, say for instance, I offend you. Do so, I steal your wallet. Not that I ever would, but if I did... That would bother you. You would feel bad about that. But the sin that I committed is a sin against God. Because God said don't steal. And I disobeyed God. Now what I did to you was a personal offense. And when I sin against God, it hurts the relationship with God. And when I sin against, or when I commit a personal offense against you, it hurts our relationship. So Jesus by coming and having authority to forgive sins, what he's really doing there is he's blessing us to have relationships. Number one, a relationship with God. He's the Savior. He, he's the one who loves us and created us. And we can have a joyful fellowship with him if our sins are forgiven. But he also created us to be a community of one another that forgives each other so we can have a beautiful community of, uh, that's kind of like a slice of heaven on earth. That's what the church is. It's a slice of heaven on earth. We should be about forgiving one another. So we're going to talk about that today. Our passage is Luke chapter 2, 1 through 12, and it breaks down this way. First we see the words of life. Then we see the works of faith. And then we're going to talk about the wages of sin. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for this passage in your word. A passage that shows us that Jesus is the way of salvation. He's the one with authority to forgive sins, to cancel out the debt that we owe, which of course is our own death, for the wages of sin is death. Thank you so much for our Savior Jesus. We pray we can see him clearly and wonderfully displayed in this passage from the Gospel of Mark. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so the words of faith. It comes from verses 1 and 2. When he had come back to Capernaum several days after. If you remember, when he was in Capernaum before, he healed uh, Peter's mother-in-law, and then people came at sundown because the Sabbath was over, and they came so much that he had no time to do anything, really. He was just healing one person after another. And, and he was so inundated with people and their, their temporary needs, he had a hard time finding an opportunity to deal with spiritual, eternal needs to know him. And so he couldn't explain the gospel as much as he would have liked. And so he went away and preached in other towns, and now he's coming back into Capernaum after several days. It was heard that he was at home and many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door. This is an opportunity for us to be thankful. Are you thankful? Think about what it would be like in those days when Jesus was there People had physical ailments that made them miserable. It burdened them. Uh, you can all you all know people that are going through a really rough time. Maybe they have cancer. Maybe they're uh, in a terminal diagnosis. Maybe they can't get to church. Uh, our, some of our members are, are out this week because of surgeries they've had, and they're just not able to be here. That's a heavy burden. But imagine living with those burdens and everybody gets sick at some point or another and if you can't be healed from your sickness, you're miserable for the, for the foreseeable future. And then Jesus comes, 
so many people were so desperate without a lot of help and opportunity to get their needs met. So they came to Jesus in droves. Now, we don't have to do that. We've got such a robust healthcare system. Pretty much everybody's covered by insurance to some degree. You can go to the doctor when you get, get sick. If you have a bad knee, you can get it replaced. And like uh, Barb had her knee replaced, she was up that very first day walking. It's amazing what they can do now. So I hope we're thankful that we do have a society where a lot of our needs can be met. There's a downside, though, to that blessing. And that is, because we have so much help in this world these days, a lot of times we won't turn to Jesus. We won't see that he's the one that can, the ultimate one, that, the only one that can ultimately heal and bless us. And so, because we live in an affluent society, because we live in a society where people are cared for, you know, with all the safety nets that we have in the, in the economy for, for people that are, that are needing support, that's all a good thing. But the downside is people turn to the government for their help, and they don't turn to Jesus. And so I hope you're thankful that we have such blessings. Also hope you're aware Jesus is the one we really need to turn to for the real needs that we have, the eternal needs, even the short-term needs. When you're sick, I hope you turn to him. And when you're healthy, I hope you turn to him. And know that if you know him, one day you're always going to be perfectly healthy forever. And that's a great blessing to be thankful for. So they were no long, there was no longer room for Jesus to see anyone else because they were crammed in even to the doorway. It was standing room only. And he was speaking the word to them. So at least he was able to preach to that crowd that showed up in the house. And the words of life, Jesus' words, the words that he speaks, these are inspired by God. All Scripture, every word of this Bible, is inspired by God. It's as though God's breath produced it, and it's got his power. It's all true. Everything about the Bible is believable and powerful. Look at this verse. My word will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. It's profitable It does good work in us, and that purpose is fulfilled when we hear, study, listen to, share His Word. It will not go back to God having bounced off of hard hearts. It will accomplish its purpose. God sent His Word for the purpose of blessing us, and it will. It's the Word that does the blessing because it's inspired out of His mouth. The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit. Well, that's a mysterious thought, right? God's Word actually somehow goes into the heart and it creates new thinking. It rewires the brain in some way that our new pathways are laid down and our thoughts are improved by the Word of God. If you memorize Scripture, it really does help. You'll be going through something someday where, where you're challenged and you're stressed and God's voice can whisper into your heart those words that you've memorized. And those words can actually change your outlook in your situation because it is penetrating. That Word goes into the heart as deep as can be, even to the division of soul and spirit. It is the Spirit Jesus said to the crowds that came to him for for food. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. So the Word of God is inspired and profitable, but the flesh, the human ability, the human wisdom, the human understanding is unprofitable. It profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you, they are spirit and life. God's words are words of life. They give you new life. Let's talk about the works of faith. 
So he's in the room and he's preaching his word to give life to the people. It's so crammed, no one else can get in. And they came bringing to him a man who was paralyzed, carried by four men. So four men had a friend who was paralyzed. In other words, his legs were dead. His legs did not work. He was paralyzed. And they had to carry him. They carried him on a pallet. They carried him on a mattress. They brought him to Jesus, and they couldn't get in. It was just too full in that room. He was carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. Think about life was lived on the roof in these, in these Middle Eastern towns. The roofs were like a patio. You would go up there and you would hang out your laundry. You would go up there and, and, and do things because you would get out of the house that way. And it was all packed in, houses upon house upon house, but they all had roofs and people would have fellowship from one roof to another. It was what they did. Now the roofs were, were made with beams across the stone walls and piled next, or stacked next to each other and then mud that would harden on top so that there was kind of like a, a, a ground surface or a, a, a surface that you could get around on. And so they dug through the mud and they removed the beams. In order to do that, they must have had permission of the homeowner, right? The homeowner wanted to help this fella. And uh, they, they must have agreed that when they remove the roof, they'll put it back in place. It's not, kind of, it's not quite like our homes where you remove the roof and you got to call a roofer and it's thousands of dollars to get it fixed. Uh, they they would have done, been able to do that work fairly handy, handily. But they, they removed the roof above him And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralyzed man was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, right? If you have faith in Jesus and you have a friend in need, the faith in Jesus motivates you to help the friend in need, right? James said, uh, great, you have faith without works. Well, I will show you my faith by my works. And Jesus saw these men caring about their friend. Their friend obviously wanted the help and knew that Jesus was the one to give him the help, so they brought him, and Jesus saw their faith helping their friend, going through all of this effort to open up the roof and lower their friend in. And he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. One thing we need to realize is that the reason there is any kind of sickness in this world, the reason people die, the reason there's suffering, the reason the deserts are growing, the reason that the heavens are waxing old like a garment is because there's sin in the world. God made the world perfect. He made it a paradise. He made it lush and ready for human development. God blessed his image, mankind, and he said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. He planted a garden in Eden and he said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. In other words, take this prototype of a garden and turn the whole world into it and fill it up with people and live wonderfully in love for one another and love with God. Give honor and glory to him as you have oversee the animals and take care of the environment and do everything that you're to do as God's image on earth. And God gave the people that charge. And when Adam sinned, everything from the DNA of man to the, the problems in the environment, everything came into this world that everything negative came into this world because sin allowed it in. And so there's a connection between sin and sickness. There's a connection. It doesn't mean that every person that's suffering and it's because of their own sin. It's because of sin in the world. And God is able to 
overcome the diseases, the demonic oppressions and possessions that we saw from chapter 1. Just because they're suffering doesn't mean people have to wallow without hope in the midst of their suffering because we have a God who is powerful, has authority over whatever causes our suffering. And he allows us to suffer sometimes a little longer than we would like. That's because he wants us to depend on him. And maybe we have a lesson to learn in all of that suffering so that we would realize we're not the end-all and the be-all ourselves. We must depend on God. Uh, but God does overcome suffering, and suffer, all suffering will end when his kingdom comes, when we're glorified. For his people, all suffering will end. So, as we look at the works of faith, uh, we want to see that there is a connection between sin and suffering. And this is, this is from David. This is Psalm <coughs> 32. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away. My vitality was drained away. So sin indeed is linked to suffering and suffering to sin. Now let's talk about the wages of sin. Because the wages of sin, the disobedience to God, God wants us to be loving people. And when we do things that are not loving towards people, and there's a long list of things, examples in the Bible of what kinds of things are unloving, right? Stealing and slander and on and on. But when we, when we don't love, we're violating God's command. And what happens? Well, we, we owe a debt. For the world to be right, there needs to be justice. The bad people need to be punished appropriately. And the good people need to have their righteousness lifted up as the noonday. Now, of course, we know we're all sinners, so there's no good people. We all owe the debt of sin. What is the wages of sin, by the way? Well, in Romans it says the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. That's a wonderful word, but. The wages of sin is death. Oh no, that means because I have disobeyed God, because you have disobeyed God, we owe our lives. Our lives are forfeit. We deserve what we get. We deserve to die. God, of course, being a loving God, gives us a Savior who will forgive our sins and give us eternal life. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's not a, a debt we pay off. It's a debt that is canceled because Jesus paid it. But some of the scribes, now the scribes were the Bible teachers. They knew this book inside and out, and they were very careful to, to teach the letter of the law with the traditions of, of man as well. But the letter of the law, that was their expertise. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak this way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive, God, can forgive sins but God alone? Now I have a question. Is that good theology? Was Jesus blaspheming when he said, your sins are forgiven? So it's actually a very good and important question. And there's a, two answers. One is yes and one is no. Of course Jesus isn't blaspheming, but the, the, Pharisee, or the scribes have a point. This is David again. This is after he sinned with Bathsheba. He stole the wife of his friend Uriah, and to cover it up, he arranged for Uriah to be killed. So murder and stealing a wife. Those are David's sins. And when David came to the point where he realized his sin against God, he wrote Psalm 51 as an apology prayer. And part of it says, Against you, you only, 
have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight? You might say he sinned against Uriah because he had him killed. But the sin is actually when we disobey God. And David showed unloving attitude towards Uriah when he stole his wife and had him killed. I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. You are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. God, David said, you have every right to hold me accountable for the wages of sin. If I were struck dead right now, you would be perfectly in your rights to do that. Because I sinned. So who can forgive God? Give, who can forgive sins? Well, of course, only God can forgive sins. And these Pharisees saw Jesus saying, your sins are forgiven, as though Jesus had the authority for, to forgive sins. What were the scribes missing? They were missing a very important fact. Jesus is God. The Son of God is is the same nature as the Father. Jesus has divine authority even to forgive sins. So, the Pharisees were right to point out theologically, sin is an offense to God. When we disobey Him and we act unloving towards each other, that is a sin. And God is the one offended, and God is the one that has to forgive because the world needs to be a just place. And God will... will the judge of all the earth will do right. Thankfully, God became a man, Jesus. So he could walk among us, he could relevantly talk to us, he could come alongside of us, encourage us, embrace us, show us the way, teach us the truth. Jesus did that for all mankind. Where Adam sinned, plunging all mankind into sin and ruin, Jesus was the victor over sin and death. And he rose again, leading all of his people to eternal life. So immediately, Jesus was aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves and said to them, Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the man who is paralyzed, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk. But so that you may know, Jesus is about to do something to convince the stubborn scribes that their theology was wrong. The experts in the Bible were wrong. They're not wrong on a technical level because sins are offenses to God and only God can forgive sins. They're wrong in who Jesus was. And he was about to show them who he was. Now, in the back of Jesus' mind, he must have been very frustrated with these hard-hearted so-called religious experts. At another point in Scripture, he said, a wicked and perverse generation seeks after a sign. You won't believe me? you got to see it for yourselves? You're putting my word to the test? You refuse to believe the truth I preach to you until you see some evidence that what I'm saying is true. He had to be a little bit irritated. Right? In... In 1 Corinthians 1, Paul addressed a similar problem. He said, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? In other words, who understands these things? Who's got enough mental powers to figure out the universe? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Tell you what, it's all about today Science this and science that. Science has all the answers. And if we don't know it, we'll find it out because the human brain is sufficient. It's going to get us to the knowledge we need. We don't need this book, but mind you. This book is a fairy tale. It's a pie in the sky by and by. And the old man upstairs says, hey, read this book and comfort yourselves. But it's not true because what's true is science. That's kind of the worldview of today. 
people, people, they teach it in the schools that God didn't create. Man just kind of evolved out of some primordial soup through a process of evolution. And all of a sudden, somehow, after a, millions and millions of years, all this wonderful, fearfully and wonderfully made human structure that we have with intricate DNA and such so, ex- so exquisitely designed, it just kind of came along by nature. Right, right. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in God's wisdom, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. You're not going to come to know God, no matter how smart you are, no matter how educated you are, no matter how much you can put facts together into a theory, like scientists, you're never going to arrive at the knowledge of God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the preached message, the preaching of the cross, the gospel, the good news that God loves us in spite of our sinfulness, and He sent His Son to be our Savior, and that Son was abused. He was nailed to a cross. He willingly suffered that indignation, that, that our indignation. He suffered that penalty of death in our place. That is a powerful message that Jesus came to deliver. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the preached message to save those who will believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs. They were stubborn. They wouldn't just accept the truth. They had to see it with their own eyes. And the Greeks search for wisdom. Other cultures may not want signs, but they want to have it make sense in their logical minds. But we preach Christ crucified. That's our message. To Jews, a stumbling block, and to Gentiles, foolishness. People aren't going to come to Jesus because they see a miracle. They aren't going to come to Jesus because of logical arguments that show that we must be created because we're so well designed. Those, you can't discount that. I mean, it's obvious we're designed. We obviously have a designer. And miracles that happen have no explanation other than God did that. Right? But that's not going to produce saving faith. What produces saving faith is the message preached. The gospel. To those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Preaching the gospel of Jesus is what saves. That's the saving message. But so that you may know, Jesus is showing a compassion towards these men that he's very disappointed with. Just like the leper, right? The leper was going to spoil his opportunity to preach by blabbing about what happened to him and everybody's going to come to Jesus and he's not going to be able to preach in the synagogues anymore. That happened last uh, chapter. Now he sees the scribes. They're, they're, he knows their hearts are suspicious of him. They're doubting the truth he's preaching. And, and they're pointing out a technicality. Well, he can't say your sins are forgiven because they didn't know he was God. And so Jesus, even though he has every right to say, you fools, you're going to die for your sins and get what you deserve. He could have said that. But instead, so that you may know. I want you to know. And I know you demand a sign. Signs aren't always convincing on a heart level. But what they do, when they appeal to your mind, wow, how did that happen? That holds you even more accountable to believe. But so that you may know that the Son of Man, he calls himself the Son of Man, he's the Son of God, but he wants everyone to know he's the man that has come to restore humanity to a right relationship with God, has authority on earth to forgive sins, 
Now he's done talking with them. He says it like this, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he turns away and he talks to the paralyzed man. He said to the paralyzed man. It's like he turned his back on the, one, the, the teachers. Like, watch this. And then he said to the paralyzed man, I say to you, get up. Pick up your pallet and go home. What happened when Jesus' authoritative word said that? And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Wow. Who could ever argue against Jesus is God? Jesus has power to forgive sins. I'm sure people could still find a way to argue that. Those scribes were now more accountable than before the miracle to believe. And yet, sometimes our hearts can be so stubborn, we won't believe this book because it doesn't make sense to our logical minds. Or we haven't seen enough evidence. There's too much suffering in the world. There can't be a loving God who's powerful Because there's so much suffering. That just doesn't add up. Well, that's a logical argument against the existence of God. It might be a very effective logical argument to some people. Unless it's also true that Jesus is bringing the kingdom of God to earth when the suffering will be over. So as a temporary thing, we're going to go through some suffering. You do that every time you go to the dentist. You go through temporary suffering and you're glad you did because... What would result, if you didn't, is long-term suffering. So sometimes the suffering in this world is, is put there by God to create a sense of need so that they would turn to Him. Because what we really need is not to have our sickness healed, but to have our soul saved. If we have dead legs, we're paralyzed like this, this man on the pallet, or Other, I mean, there's some Christians we know. Johnny Erickson Tata, she's paralyzed. When the body is dead, it needs Jesus to bring it back to life. God's word, the preaching of the cross, is what does that. That's what we need to believe. That message needs to get out. Of course we're going to show compassionate works and help people suffering as much as we can, but it's got to go with the word that will save their soul forever. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Forgiveness is really the gift that you can't keep to yourself. If you've been forgiven, if God has said your sins are canceled, No more will I ever judge you. You're you're my child. You're going to have an eternity in glory. When he does that for someone, that person has every reason to hope their sins are gone because they've been forgiven. Notice the word forgiven has a root word, give. It's a gift. You don't deserve gifts. You're not entitled to gifts. Gifts are extravagant expressions of love. I hope when you give a Christmas gift, you're not thinking, well, they gave me a gift, I better give them one. Or I'll be the jerk. But think, rather, I love this person, and that's why I'm giving the gift. You don't deserve forgiveness. We do a bad thing, And it shows we're a bad person. Okay, so when you forgive, it's a gift to restore a relationship with that person. Forgiveness on the divine level, when God forgives our sins, 
It's because our sins are blocking a relationship we could have with Him. It's our fault. His arm is not so short that He cannot save, nor His ear so dull that He cannot hear. But He wants the wicked to forsake His way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and He will have mercy on him and He will abundantly pardon him. God wants to give you the gift of forgiveness. But you don't deserve it. You can never deserve it. You and I are are flawed people. People with sins that deserve death. But God will give if you trust Him to give. He will give you that gift. Now there's another level of forgiveness and that's between people. So when we offend one another, we need to overcome that offense and restore that relationship. So, let's talk about forgiveness. First of all, why you need it. Why do you need forgiveness? Well, you definitely need forgiveness because of a relationship with God. My Heavenly Father will do the same to you also. This is referring to the story Jesus just gave of the the man that owed a huge debt and he, and he asked for forgiveness, and it was forgiven. And then he turned around and he told this other guy that owed him a little bit of money, I'm not going to forgive you. And he was mean to him. And then he, Jesus said, my heavenly Father will do the same to you also if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. That's a tall order. Because we can be very stubborn in our unforgiveness. Our pride is hurt, and we don't want to let it go. We can stew for years in an offense. We can find all kinds of reasons to speak ill of people, complain about how they've offended us. When you're the one that offended, that's how people are going to treat you unless you overcome that offense. Now, how do you do that? So let's go, how do you get forgiveness? How do you get forgiveness? I tell you no. This is to a question that was asked, um, were these people that had that horrible experience worse sinners than everybody else? One, One of them, a tower fell and crushed some people and People were wondering, ooh, is God more mad at them than us because the power didn't fall on us? Jesus says, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. What does it mean to repent? If you want forgiveness, you repent. Repentance essentially means taking responsibility as a sinner, telling God, I sinned, I deserve the wages of sin, which is death. I'm a complete failure. I need forgiveness. Could you please reestablish that relationship with me? Could you save me? Make me one of your children. So how do you get it? You apologize. You turn from your sin. You take responsibility. You admit you were wrong. You didn't you, you, you caused that person to have hurt feelings or whatever it was. Doesn't mean they're going to forgive you because it's on them to forgive you. But that's how you get it. So between people, forgiveness is really, can we be friends and can we move forward in our friendship? Or are you just going to dump me because I offended you? Now, if I offend you and I say, I don't care that I offended you, just lump it, accept it. At that point, I'm the one preventing the relationship from going forward. Right? I want the relationship to go forward, so what I need to do is I need to express to you in some way I've taken responsibility for offending you. Now let's talk about the other side. 
when do you give forgiveness? It's very possible that you can give forgiveness too early. If you walk up and smack me in the face and say, oh, I smacked you in the face. I don't care that I smacked you in the face. I kind of think it's fun to smack you in the face. Well, I shouldn't just automatically say, oh, that's okay. Go ahead. We'll still be friends. Because that person has offended me and hasn't take, cleared it up. God's not going to automatically forgive you. He's going to want you to take responsibility as a sinner and trust him for forgiveness. On a human level, the same thing is kind of true. You want that person that offended you to realize that what he did was wrong, to feel some remorse over it, to express their, their, their sorrow that they did that, take responsibility, it was my fault, I shouldn't have done that. When do you give it? If your brother sins, rebuke him. Don't just forgive him, express to him, hey, that hurt my feelings. You shouldn't have done that. Why would you ever want to steal my lunch or whatever the sin may be, whatever the offense may be? You rebuke him. Let the person know you're not happy with them. And if he repents. So if, you're, if you've rebuked your brother because he's offended you, and if he repents, forgive him. Accept the friendship. Allow it to move forward because the person has taken responsibility for their sins. You've had sins. You took responsibility. God forgave you. Therefore, when someone takes responsibility for the way they've hurt you, you then move forward and have a friendship. That's when you give it. You don't want to give it too early because they won't have improved. They won't, you won't help them be a better person with better social skills and better able to have their own friendships. Rebuke them, and then when they repent, forgive them. One more verse I leave you with. Be kind to one another. This is, of course, talking about Christians to Christians. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. One more thing I want to say before we close. You may have been offended. You may have rebuked the person so that they're very clear that your feelings were hurt. Now it's on them. And so far as it depends on you, you've done your part. Now they haven't taken responsibility and they've clearly shown they don't want the friendship with you. Two things. First of all, it's not time to forgive and to let that relationship go forward. But second, second of all, you're stuck having been offended by someone you care about. That hurts. That's pain you don't deserve. You've tried to heal a situation, the other person has rejected you. You can't have a relationship, you can't forgive, you can't, in that sense, move forward but you still got pain to deal with. That's when you come back to this verse. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, which you can't do and they don't take responsibility, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. That's the remedy. Reacknowledge that before God you were a sinner and God lovingly sent you a Savior to take away the wages of sin that you owe. Know that that relationship is forever. God's a perfect giver and you are with Him and He is with you. 
and where you would like this human relationship to be restored because it hurts to have been offended that way, you do everything you can to put it in God's hands, thanking Him for forgiving you. And then pray for your loved one who is estranged. Pray that God will get after them in a holy way and they will eventually realize the kind of jerk they were and will want to seek you out for forgiveness. May never happen, in which case the universe will be in balance when God punishes his sin. But if it does happen, and you, only God can do it, change a heart, when he wants his heart to be changed, he trusts the gospel, realizes he, he broke a relationship off with you, and comes back to you, that kind of healing is amazing. Either way, God's got your back, and you can always go back to that. It hurts. It might hurt for years. Don't stop praying. Just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. And God didn't forgive you until you repented. Then he canceled out your debt. Same thing is true with the person that hurt you. When they turn and apologize, accept responsibility, forgive them. It's not easy, but it's the right thing to do. And we need it. We need to do it. Don't forgive too early. Let the healing process begin with the person that offended you taking responsibility. Then, although you may have a trust issue, still forgive them and move on. If they do it 70 times 7 and they apologize each time, forgive them and move on. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for this instruction. It's challenging, but it also causes us to think about you being so loving and generous to save us by a gift to forgive our sins when we don't deserve it. It's a free gift. Now, the person who offends us, they don't deserve it. But we give the gift if they turn from their, that offense. Help us, Lord, to have the faith to see that we're forgiven. We can, we can know that you've forgiven us. We don't owe penance to pay for our own sins. You've put all of that responsibility on Jesus' shoulders. And he died to satisfy our debt. We're so thankful for that. In Jesus' name, amen.